Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Imad Akund of Mercury.co. How's your day going? It's good. Great. Thanks for having me. Where are you based right now? Uh, we're in San Francisco. You can see the streets of Soma right outside. Awesome. That's great. But you're originally from London, right? Yeah, I actually was born in Pakistan. Then I grew up in London and we moved to San Francisco about 12 years ago. With And Hayzap was your company. Is that what took you here to San Francisco, correct? Like, uh, Well, actually, Mercury is my fourth company. Okay. <laughs> so my, my first company I did in London, and the second and the third one uh, was ClickFast and, and Hayzap, and my fourth one's Mercury. And I moved to San Francisco when I did my second one, ClickFast. Oh, awesome. Cool. And have you been here ever since or uh, been yeah. bouncing back and forth? Yeah. yeah, I'm just like a bit of... Uh, myopically obsessed startup person so i just <laughs> you know go back to see family but apart from that i'm always here yeah it's hard to leave we recently moved just across i've been san francisco 22 years and just recently moved across the bridge to marin and you know it's a little bit different but i i miss san francisco already even though i'm coming in still pretty often yeah. it's, well, it's a special know. place yeah very good so what is mercury what do you what do you do uh, yeah, we are, we're building banking for startups. So we basically give uh, people a checking account, a debit card, and a savings account, uh, normally with 1.5% interest rate. You can sign up all online. Uh, you just go to mercury.co, click sign up, go. It takes about 10 minutes to fill out the application, and you can have a bank account within kind of uh, one or two days. Uh, so it's kind of the easiest, quickest way to get a bank account, but also yeah, we're a product-driven, customer-centric company, so you know, we don't charge you weird fees. It's all free, uh, and it's all transparent, and the product actually you know, is really good. <laughs> you can search for transactions all the way back. Uh, you can you know, send money in like a few clicks, uh, and we're continually kind of improving the product. We just launched an API uh, to make it easy to kind of reconcile transactions and make pr payments programmatically, and yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in our pipeline coming up. Cool. What was the, the genesis story? What was the motivation for banking for startups? Yeah, you know, I've had this idea for like, I guess like seven-ish years now. Uh, and I've just been, I'm a very product-minded person. You know, I try to make good products. I try to use good products. And I've just, banking has just always been this thing where like, especially in the startup world, you're just using these like archaic, awful things that charge you weird fees. The websites don't work. Um, it's hard to get things done. You have to call them up. I hate calling people. So that's a personal pet peeve of mine. So from that sense, it seemed obvious that someone should innovate her. Um, I also really needed an API at my previous company to be able to, you know, we were building a marketplace. So being able to reconcile payments coming in and send payments to our lenders, uh, that was important to us. Uh, and it just, you know, I'm, it's my fourth company. So I wanted to do something kind of really big and hairy that was in a big market that had like a problem that I was very passionate about and served on serving entrepreneurs was like always, you know, something I like to do since like I am one and I talk to a lot of them. So everything kind of fit together for me. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the genesis. So we started properly in 2017 and we launched uh, this year in April. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, we're customers of Silicon Valley Bank and, you know, I'm mostly happy with them, but their, their web app is abysmal. It's unbelievable how bad it is. Like their yeah, support should, is good, but <laughs> the actual should move over. is terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I think anytime someone calls us for support, that's a failure of the product, right? Like the product should be good enough that you don't need to like contact people to get things done. And I, I don't think banks really understand that mentality. They think like, oh, someone's contacting us. That means we can build a relationship. Like I've actually right. had conversations with them. They said that. I'm like, no, that's a failure in relationship. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. I'm going to turn this whole interview into a sales process now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, and I assume it's all online virtual or are you going to open a physical branch or what? Uh, yeah, no, it's all online. We might have some physical branches, but it's a, yeah, it's a real bank account. It's not like a virtual bank account. Like it's a, we work with a partner bank that's got 
yeah, 12 branches in like Tennessee and Arkansas and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, but uh, so it's all online. Uh, and that's, yeah, I, I think really, I, we deal with people who don't need physical presences and, you know, we, we try to make it so everything just works and in self-service, but we also yeah. have a phone number that you can call or email or, or like intercom to chat to us. You probably don't like this question because I hate these type of questions, but I'm going to ask it anyway. We were at Disrupt, TechCrunch Disrupt last week and Brex announced their, I guess it's a bank or something similar. Maybe it's a checking account. Is that, I don't know, does that do anything for you or is it just like, hey, validating, right? Or what? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously like, yeah, it's probably like our first real like startup-y competitor. Uh, Right now, it's pretty different. It's not a real bank account. It's a, you know, it's kind of like a cash management account and it doesn't, you know, it's not fully featured. Like it doesn't deal with check deposits and sending checks. And I think there's like a, you know, a bunch of other limitations. Uh, yeah. I think as a, it's much more of like a add-on to the credit card. Whereas, you know, for us, like molding a great bank account and having APIs and other things is like our main focus and we'll continue innovating on it. Uh, so I think like, I think it's pretty different. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some customers that choose us over them or vice versa. Uh, but yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not something that like we focus on too much. Like we have yeah, a very kind of deep and long-term vision and mission and that's what yeah. we're kind of delivering on. It's always one of these questions because that's why I say it's such an annoying question. I hate when people ask me those type of like, well, your competitor has this. What do you think about that? And like, I think uh, I like your answer of sort of we have our own deep long-term vision and we're sticking to it and making our customers happy, right? Isn't that, yeah. I don't know. It's always this question of like, how do you sort of react to or not to like competitor big announcements if you even bother with it? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, when you're focusing on something and it's your main priority, it's just very hard for someone to kind of, have a side project and have a big business and like have that kind of thrive under that. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, it's actually hard to come up with examples where that succeeded. Um, yeah. But I'm sure there's some. Very cool. Well, congrats on the launch earlier this year. So I guess how much have you guys raised and how many rounds? So we did a seed round kind of straight off the bat. We raised 6 million uh, in 2008. 17 so august 2017 and then we just raised uh, our series a uh 20 million dollars uh basically we announced it I think, three weeks ago but we raised it about two months ago and um i'm quoting pitch book so correct me if i'm wrong but crv led that round is that right yes yeah, so and recent horowitz led our seed round and crv led our series a awesome that's a great list i see uh again quoting pitch book but you had like some interesting names on there, Andre Iguodala and Serena Ventures, which I think is Serena Williams Fund. Is that, is that right? Yep. How did how'd you get these celebrities, these interesting sports celebrities involved? Uh, yeah, so actually a lot of that came through in Andreessen Horowitz. They have like this side fund called the Culture Fund, uh, oh, yeah, which is right. run by this great guy, Chris Lyons. Uh, and you know, they participate as a smaller check alongside Andreessen Horowitz investments. Uh, and they're just like, I, I didn't know this existed uh, from the outside, but they're also just super happy to introduce you to some of these people. Uh, so the, all, all the LPs, I can't remember exactly how much they are, like 50 of them are all, you know, these celebrities. Uh, so a lot of these connections came through that. Uh, a couple from like other parts of my network. Uh, but it was definitely like, yeah, it was it was not the main part of the fundraising. Obviously, like getting the lead investor was the main part, but it was it was kind of like a fun side thing we did. Do they are they active? I mean, they're busy people, right? They're professional sports stars. Do you, are they actively involved, or is it more of a, a a cool name to have on the cap table? You know. Yeah, you know, we have a hundred investors, um, so I. My philosophy with Mercury has been to do have like a lead investor that really owns a big chunk and is very involved and in having kind of a lot of small checks from a lot of different people. Uh, there's a, I kind of think of them as like a few pieces. Number one is, you know, a brand kind of association, uh, you know, whether it's like 
you know, someone who's well known in the startup community, like Elad Gill or Naval Ravikant, and all this you know, uh, celebrity kind of people like Iguodala and uh, Larry Fitzgerald and things like that. Uh, so that's that's kind of part one. Uh, I think this you don't know when like you need something from someone mm. uh, and it's nice to just have people that can like back you and be useful in like whatever ways. So, you know, I'm, I like giving like really good investor updates and that's like, that allows them to be like, you know, allows me to not have to spend too much active time with them and they can passively kind of continue to track us. And then I'll always have asks in there and then, you know, I'm often surprised who kind of is helpful and delivers on these things. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of my main thing. Uh, I think later on when we go outside kind of just our startup uh, ecosystem plan, uh, I think the celebrities will be more useful in just mm. building trust and potentially having some kind of distribution help. Uh, so it's more like some of part of it is like kind of long-term planning as well. Yeah, cool. Good. Any uh, stories in putting that round together? I mean, that's a lot of investors, 100 investors, and obviously a amazing lead name Andreessen on the seed and CRV on the series a are these relationships you built up from the past was there any uh, challenge and didn't you know did you put together a funnel and run a process or was it more just you know folks you had known or what um yeah I mean I think fundraising is always a sales process I don't it's a you always build a funnel and there's like you know you can never know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, uh, and I was actually having a conversation about this with someone recently, like sometimes actually like the people that you think are most likely to invest don't invest because they're like all gung-ho before you do something. And then like once you do it, they're like, okay, yeah, they don't like it all. But whatever, <laughs> they have their own kind of story. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you always have to run a funnel. Like I don't think, I think one of the biggest mistakes sometimes people make is like think that they've got something in the bag when they don't have it in the bag. Like sure. Yeah, you definitely don't have it in the bag until you've got the money in the bank account. But yeah. sometimes at least you need the term sheet signed before you consider it in the bag. Uh, I think, you know, at the same time, like I think it is a sales process, but it's not always like a short term sales process. So, you know, and recent Horowitz, like we raised in August 2017, uh, but I was talking to the partner there since like February 2017, something like that. Uh, and yeah, I just reached out to him. I didn't know him before that point. I was just on an email thread with him considering concerning something completely different. I reached mm -hmm. out to him, said, hey, I need this banking thing. Uh, he, knew, you know, he knows a lot about this space. He's the fintech investor at Andreessen Horowitz at the time, the only one. Uh, and yeah, he was open to meeting and then we met a couple of times. So yeah, uh, like these, uh, yeah, a lot of these investor relationships are like long-term relationships and they're very like human relationships. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes dealing with the two as too much of a sales process where you're just like, okay, I met this person. Like, how do I leverage him? How do I, mm. you know, how many emails do I send to close this person? It's like not the right way to think about it. It's much more of a relationship led sales process. So totally. I think it helps to, yeah, I don't want to like waste a ton of your time, but it helps to build these relationships over time. Um, similar with CRV, like, you know, I probably spoke to them maybe like eight or nine years ago when they didn't fund my previous company. Uh, but, you know, we have we have this relationship somewhat built because of that. Uh, so, so yeah, I think but you can do it fast, especially at seed stage. Like, you know, these, these investors don't necessarily need to have met you tons of times, but it helps to build up the relationship over time. Very good. Cool. Well, um, you've invested in quite a few startups as well. How many startups and it's all been angel deals, seed deals or what? Uh, yeah, I think I've done like maybe two series A's, but it's almost universally kind of seed investments. Uh, I think around 120 since like 2016. And what's been your, and that's a lot. I mean, that's a huge number. What's been your methodology for getting deal flow? Like how are these deals coming? To uh, yeah, a lot of them happen through Y Combinator. Um, I don't go, well, I do go to demo day, but not demo day specifically, but you know, I've, I've done Y Combinator twice. I did the 07 and 09 batch and I was okay. a part-time partner there briefly. And all my friends are like investors in Y Combinator now. Uh, so that's really like, I would say the bulk of the deal flow. Um, there's obviously like 
friends that do startups uh, or friends of friends that do startups and uh, you know, I end up funding those. Um, I, yeah, I, I always like also put myself in the shoes of like where I was 10 years ago. And if someone just emails me, I try to respond. Obviously <laughs> I get a, quite a lot of those. Um, You're going to get a lot after this, <laughs> after this yeah. airs. I mean, I don't mind. I try to, <laughs> Yeah, having said that, I'm actually not investing right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there we go. I'm, I'm still doing some around like the YC batches just because it's like a very short time period, but I'm just like pretty focused on Mercury. So I'm not investing just so if people do email me, I'm happy to like look at it and respond and try to be helpful, but uh, I'm not an active investor. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of like roughly where the deals come from. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So what do you not actively investing? That's that's fine. But what have you been looking for when you're making these investments? How are you screening? You know, how are you filtering? How are you kind of, so, yeah. Yeah. There's a, I mean, there's a bunch of factors. I think the two that are like most important to me is markets. So like, I just, yeah, there's a bunch of markets that I find interesting. Uh, like I like healthcare, I like self-driving vehicles. I still yep. like, you know, B2B SaaS type things. Um, and there's a bunch of things I just don't know that much about. Like I've looked at a bunch of kind of genetic and bio companies and I just don't know, like, I just don't know how to make a judgment on it. So, you yeah. know, I don't know how I even learned to do that. Um, so I try to like uh, make a judgment on the market. Um, you know, I want to think of it. It doesn't have to be huge right now, but I want to feel like either the, there's a trend towards it being huge in the future or it's already like a big market. I think that's like, determination number one and then part two is founders you know is there a is there a history of them doing like things successfully and it doesn't have to be oh they've done the startup already it could be you know while they were at yeah, university they did like a project that was had like some sort of thing so like i think a history of like success of some sort is useful um it might be at a company uh it might be like they you know, understand that particular market really deeply because they worked in it at like a, a some sort of process that like is compelling. Uh, and then the other part, which is a bit subjective is like, you know, when I meet them, like, like, do I feel like it's someone that like I would enjoy talking to and working with and like, sure. it's, you know, what's that process, right? Like it's a little bit you know, human and sometimes you just get a really good vibe of someone. Sometimes you're like, you know, they might be perfectly fine, but you're like, that's not the kind of person I would want to work with. Uh, so I guess those are the factors, you know, I like when I invest in something, I'd like to be as helpful as I can be and to be helps helpful. Like if I'm introducing them to my friends, if I'm like introducing them to VCs or trying to be helpful, like I feel like I want to be hundred percent conviction personally in order to do that for them. Because mm. if I'm, if I'm, a, yeah, if I'm feeling off about it in some way, then I just can't be as helpful. Uh, so really all of those things have to come together. Yeah, totally. Um, really interesting. When you were jumping around a little bit, but when you were raising for Mercury, did you get much pushback on kind of your market of selling to startups? I am kind of a personal question because like we're also selling to startups and some of the investors I met with didn't like our market I, or is your answer that your startups are just a starting point or, or what? Yeah, I think it helps a little bit for us that there's already Silicon Valley Bank out there and they're a $13 billion company and they sure. they basically only sell to startups as well. Uh, so unlike a few other kind of sectors that sell to startups, uh, we're already like a proven large market. Yeah. Uh, there's also a general trend that like startups selling to startups are now like cool again. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> the. the uh, you yeah, know, other people have done it. Like you know, Stripe is obviously like the big one. Uh, I think s we always pitched it as a starting point to like eventually do all digitally enabled businesses. Uh, I think there's a bunch of reasons why startups are interesting. Like most SMBs want to be startups and most enterprises want to be startup-y. So <laughs> it's quite a, yeah, the title by itself is, is something that people aspire to it. So it's, a, I think it's an interesting starting position. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's like, uh, ideally it is something that is more broadly applicable uh, and banking yeah. is definitely one of those things. Uh, but there's also potential to make like fairly big companies that only do startups. Uh, yeah. and then you have to really be able to grow with the company. Like if you can get to like 
seed series a series b series c startups and uh you know carter has done a good job of like growing with companies and being yeah focused. for sure awesome um so you know maybe talk a little bit about uh you've raised money in london and you've raised money in san francisco what are contrast and compare <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not a fair comparison necessarily because this was like 2007 and I think London is like a lot more, a lot more developed as a kind of startup ecosystem since then. But yeah, it's probably similar to like some non-hub cities now. I think we actually failed to raise money in London, <laughs> so it's, 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 but we tried. Uh, I think it's just like night and day, right? Like you can run like a pipeline in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and that pipeline could be huge, like mm-hmm. especially at seed stage, but even at series AOB, uh, you can have like hundreds of people at seed stage and you know, 20 to 50 people in, in, in series A. Um, like all of that is like worse than 10 X worse back when we were doing it in London. So there's just less people to speak to. They yeah. tend to be, um, yeah, they tend to have their pick, so it's not so much like there's no real urgency. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. urgency is like an important part of like actually getting a deal done in Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah, you know, they if you're good, they know that you're talking to other investors, so there's just a a need to act quickly, uh, and that's obviously important to actually get it done. Uh, whereas you don't have any of that outside. Like, um, yeah, at least back then you didn't have that in London. Uh, yeah. And there's also a part of it of like, uh, because they're at the forefront in Silicon Valley, uh, they tend to just ask smarter questions. They have seen better companies. They, you know, there's often you're talking to a VC or an angel investor that was also an investor in a billion dollar or multiple billion dollar company. So I think the types of things they care about are much more like upside focused than downside focused, which I think is, is mm. important aspect. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah it's, yeah. yeah. it's much more about like, what could this be if things went right? Not like how are like the ways this can go wrong because yeah. with every company, there's many ways it can go wrong. Uh, yeah. In, in general, like, you know, I'm, I still feel there's there's a lot of problems in the Bay Area and, and San Francisco and Silicon Valley, but I still think it, it's probably yeah the place to come if you're raising money. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there's obviously exponentially more investors here, but there's also so many startups. Do you think the proportion rises accordingly? Like, as an investor, you're probably I don't know how to ask this question, but you know what I'm saying. There is there's a lot more investors, but is there also so much more noise here? Does that create a challenge as well does that make, make sense yeah that's a good point but i think i think the amount of money here uh has grown probably faster than the number of startups uh mm. and then the other factor is like there's just like a certain threshold of like fundability that's like somewhat universal uh, maybe not universal but like i think there is like okay you've degressed enough you've got enough traction etc and at that point you're like fundable and yeah. if anything is fundable it will definitely get funded here whereas <laughs> you can be like fundable and not get funded somewhere else oh that's a good uh, way to put it yeah. i think if you're like below that fundable threshold and like then it's a little bit more about relationships etc maybe the the yeah the barrier to entry on like the below fundable threshold is like worse uh, sure yeah but but yeah, I think you know, if you're fundable, you'll get funding here. What do you, and that's I, I love that. That's that's a great way to frame it. What what do you think is fundable? I mean, like I know it's such a fuzzy question, but like, how would you define fundable at seed stage? Maybe you know, it's much easier to think about like what is definitely fundable and what is like definitely fundable is something in a big market where the founders like you know at least one of them is an engineer, ideally. Uh, it's like a high gross market market. Like it's, you know, it's like SaaS or like something that drives like 80% market and you've already reached like, let's say 20K MRR, right? That's like the definitely fundable level. Uh, big market, high gross margin, 20K MRR and with like reasonable growth to get there. Uh, yeah. I think everything below that level, it's like, okay, you know, you need, you might lose something in one sense, but then you need to make it up in another sense. So maybe your MRR isn't 20K, but uh, the market is bigger uh, or maybe you have LOIs for like a bigger thing. So, uh, and there's, yeah, 
there's the levels below that, like people get funding at every level below that and people get seed funding or don't get seed funding even at that level. But I think mostly if you've reached that kind of level and you're, especially if you're in a reasonable tech hub, you'll almost certainly get seed funding of some sort, uh, unless you're being like very unrealistic with your valuation or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, how I think about it and like, yeah, this is like generic advice, right? Like I think how to make it like specific to your companies to kind of think about like, what are the factors that I can de-risk at this level, right? I think, yeah, there's like the base level of like, is the market big enough? Is this a VC fundable idea? And if, you know, if you're just not in a VC fundable idea, then, you know, you should just try to bootstrap it and there's yeah. nothing, nothing like wrong with that. Uh, but if it is a VC fundable idea, then it's all about de-risking aspects of it. Uh, and by de-risking, I'm saying like, yeah, like there's all these risks that people take when they do seed funding. So it's like, and every company has like slightly different risks. So I'll, I'll lay out like our initial risks at Mercury, right? Number one is like, can I make a product? Mm -hmm. right? Which is like somewhat de-risk because it's my fault company and I've built a few products. So, uh, but like for someone who hasn't built a product before, it, it's a potential risk, right? Number two, does, uh, you know, do, do other entrepreneurs or like, you know, do people, are there customers for this product? Um, and that one was like a little de-risk because I was my own customer, but, you know, without actual traction and like, you know, written LOIs, it wasn't like fully de-risked. Uh, but it helped that like on you know, angel investors I was speaking to had often been entrepreneurs so they could feel the market need a little better. Uh -huh. uh, yep. Then there's like the, for us, was a regulatory side to it. So, you know, how well I could speak to like, you know, whether this was possible from like a regulation perspective. And, you know, I'd spoken to a lot of lawyers and had some opinions on that. And I'd spoken to bank sponsors and I had like some term sheets from them. Uh, so it's those types of things where like, you can't just go to an investor and say, I have this idea and here's a deck. You have to go like, okay, these are the ways I've de-risked it. Like I built the product. I have these customers lined up. I have, yeah, all of these things are like separate, like de-risking things. And like, you can't, you know, if it's a complicated enough product, you can't always de-risk all of those things. So you have to just de-risk the things you can de-risk. And like, those are the, that's what you present to investors. Totally. Great. I like that. I mean, those are good, good frameworks. What do you think about, how important is growth rate? Let's say you're at a company that's at 40K a month or 30K a month, uh, but growing like slowly or, or how important is growth rate maybe in this whole, what is I mean, fundable? I think, I think growth rate is more important than like the absolute number. Uh, like this, I think actually like flat or negative growth rate is like almost completely unfundable. Like it's not even worth going to investors with like a flat or negative growth rate. Uh, I think anything yeah it depends what number you're at like if you're below 20k and growing at like below 15 percent, it's probably unfundable month uh, over month because, yeah month over month uh it's it gets a little complicated when like people have like lumpy enterprise sales type things sure. you, you know investors are not completely stupid so hopefully they can like see that it's lumpy and like try to uh try to kind of project it out uh but yeah, growth is everything, right? Like, because no matter what your absolute value is, like the cost, the in current investor is investing, is betting that you can get 10, 20, 50 X bigger. And the only way to get that is growth, right? So uh, yeah. I think it's super important. I actually think uh, like often I speak to entrepreneurs and they spend too much time on like product and other things and they don't like spend enough time. Like, pre going to investors i mean it's different if you're like pre-traction completely right then you're selling other things completely but if you've got traction and you're at all selling like this concept that like i have users and they care about it like it has to be tied to growth um and like a part of that is also like retention like before even thinking about growth you have to think about like how retentive my product is so a lot of growth and SaaS comes from uh you get into a company and like you'll have like you know, a few people in the company use it and then you'll keep adding seats in the company. So a lot of the growth doesn't always have to do with like, I'm going to add new customers, but like if you've got good retention and these customers like keep buying more, yeah. that's where a lot of growth can come from. Uh, but yeah, I would, yeah, I would solve retention before growth, but then, but you have to, yeah. that's part of the parcel. 
Yeah, totally. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, what else? Let's see. Let's talk about um, some of the things maybe you did wrong as a, a first time founder back in your first company or second company and, and maybe other tips for, you know, the mi mistakes you see founders make when maybe they're approaching you and trying to get in touch with you or pitching you, stuff like that. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think like something that we didn't do particularly well until like later on is like it helps to, I mean, I don't know what, like this word networking, but it helps to just have like a really good entrepreneur community. Uh, like it helps to just talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, know them and like, you know, be friends with them. Um, I think it's useful for like just your personal psychology anyway, but it's also just useful to like, you know, help get introductions to investors like other entrepreneurs are actually the best way to get to other investors uh, and not just any investor you can get to good investors right because like they're not going to recommend you know, investors that perform badly for yeah. them uh, uh, so I think that's like actually like the biggest thing to do and entrepreneurs are much easier to talk to and network with as an entrepreneur than investors uh, yeah. just because like they're not you know you're not selling to them so it's not like a sales driven process it's just like hey i'm hanging out and like um i think that's probably like the most obvious good tip uh there's there's definitely like a i think it's actually better to just be very fundable i think that's <laughs> that's like the most obvious tip i would give like i think sometimes people do think about like investing too much as like a milestone by itself. Uh, whereas like what they should really think about is like, how do I make this company just great? And then like investing will happen because it's yeah. like, I can raise money because of it. Uh, I mean, as, as I said earlier, I still think like just moving to the Bay area <laughs> and like, you know, we did it through going into Y Combinator and I think Y Combinator yeah, is, and potentially other accelerators are like, yeah the best way to kind of break into these ecosystems uh, sure. and have this like kind of stamp where like, you know, you're, you're not just like noise that you're like, people think about you as like, Oh, that's a company I should look out for because it's a Y Combinator back company kind of thing. Uh, so I think there's, you know, I think there's lots of ways nowadays where like good entrepreneurs can get into like ecosystems and get funding quickly. Uh, so I would think about leveraging those. Um, yeah. What else is like an interesting tip? Uh, any tips you see that stuff. people like people that are approaching you or maybe mistakes people make when they're either approaching you or pitching you or or trying to close you <laughs> whatever you know kind of like things that turn off what are your turn off maybe <laughs> ask it in the strange yeah, way i mean i'm like all about like short emails you know just like just establish like one or two bullet points slash one or two sentences, just like tell me what you do and like why it's interesting kind of thing and what's your traction. Uh, I think it just helps a lot to be introduced by someone. Uh, you know, I've invested in 120 companies. Like it's not, it doesn't seem like it's that hard to get to me, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, so I feel like get, trying to, you know, leveraging one of those connections to get to me is, is always better. Uh, and then beyond that, like, you know, I don't think it's like that tricky to, yeah, I, I normally make it like a fairly quick job. I'm not investing right now. So firstly, right. like if I was, I normally make like a pretty good quick judgment on like whether it's interesting to me. Like there's just a whole set of things that are not interesting to me and the sort of things that are interesting to me. Uh, so I don't think, I don't think you need to sell too hard. I, like sales tactics in general are extreme so put offs. Like you know, two emails are fine. More than two is bad like you know trying to use like obvious pressure tactics like you mm -hmm. know this round is closing in one week like you better jump on it and i'm just like i don't even know you uh yeah, so, right. uh yeah i mean i i always prefer personally like pdfs uh i know there's this whole like twitter debate around pdfs versus docsend right uh i still prefer pdfs i think it's much simpler <laughs> but you know i'm open to both um yeah this is good so no obvious you know no high pressure sales tactics or stuff but how uh like you mentioned before the call how often should f founders follow up um sequencing investors any tips around those those things sort of like the tactical you know, yeah. Thing, yeah you know i think it's good to basically like how i try to do it is like yeah i think make a pitch deck like i'm a deck kind of guy but whatever you can write a story down 
go talk to entrepreneurs first, right? Like these are your, hopefully your friends, but people you know, maybe that you don't know them that well and just pitch them, right? Like yeah. just say, hey, can I have some feedback? And that's a good way, which is like a high pre- low pressure situation to improve your pitch. But it also help, hopefully gets them excited about it so they're going to introduce you to their like, investors and their investor friends. So that, that's kind of like step one. Once you're happy with the pitch, step two is like go talk to like the friendliest investors you know i think um like people that hopefully will just say yes to you because they know you uh they're like smallish checks so there's not like tons of pressure for them to like make a you know like make do lots of due diligence and like all the stuff that's going to be slow uh and our and uh, like when i say do this stuff like i mean like quickly it's not like do one thing wait two months and then do another thing like this is like one week i talk to entrepreneurs next week talk to friendly investors and then third week, I would start talking to like potential lead investors that can do bigger checks. And hopefully by then you've already got some commitments where like you can say, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah is investing. And like, I have this much committed. Now I'm trying to yeah, close the lead. Uh, and then even with the leads, I would start with like, you know, that one I'd maybe reverse. Like I wouldn't put the most likely ones to close too early, uh, like I would probably put slightly less likely and ones I'm not excited about early. And then like, then the more likely ones and then the ones I'm excited about later. Uh, but again, like quite soon together, you, uh, like the whole thing with investing is like, it's not about pressure, but like you just want to get like both from like, you want to get on with your own business and also yeah. from the perspective of like, you kind of want to create some tension and like you want to have momentum in the process. I don't, I'm avoiding the word FOMO because I don't sure, think that's sure, like sure. the right mentality. <laughs> uh, but there's just like something about it, like, okay, you know, this is, ob- I just talked to this entrepreneur, it's just obvious this round is happening no matter what, like this person looks like they're going to succeed. And it's kind of like a microcosm of like whether people think you'll succeed in your business. Like if they think they're going su- to succeed in your fundraising, it implies that you'll succeed in your business, even though that's not necessarily like uh, true. Uh, and yeah, so it's just, you really have to run this process and, I don't, in terms of like following up, I think with seed investors and angels, like they're often busy and they do get distracted. I don't, if they don't follow up straight away, uh, I don't think it necessarily means they're out. Uh, so I would still bug them, not that many times, like once or twice. Uh, especially if you can show momentum when you bug them, if you're like, oh, you know, you have 100K and you talk to someone and mm. a few yeah. minutes later you bug them and say, oh, blah, 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 just invested. I'd love to have you in there, et cetera. Uh, I wouldn't go too fine grain. Like I think one thing entrepreneurs tend to do is like focus on uh, problems a little too much. It's like, Oh, this person said like, he didn't like this aspect. Let me just send off like a massive bullet point and like addressing this thing. Uh, I think actually like often you want to focus on the upside things. So Mm. focusing too much on the things they didn't like about it (laughs) might not actually be that good. Uh, And yeah, that's the kind of tactics I would do there. I love it. I'm taking copious notes here really good stuff um this is awesome well i love it all um anything else you uh you want to mention that we haven't covered or we've covered a lot here um any other last i think there's definitely like a i think the psychology aspect of it is like is hard like fundraising is always hard but like you're gonna get a lot of no's i think it's like one way to view it that like helps me sometimes is to kind of view it as like a game Yep. Uh, where you're just going to play all of these things and you're like basically like firing all these and you know, missiles <laughs> and hoping like, you know, one or two hit. Uh, it's just like that first bit of getting like the first few yeses is like by far the hardest. And like, I think you just want to stay very positive and focused on that objective. And it just, yeah, eventually it becomes like easy. Like once you're like 50% through, hopefully, uh, but like staying like very positive and like, um, you know, one thing that YC does, which I quite like, is like having a plan A, plan B, plan C. Mm. Just like, you know, like what's the minimum money I could get away with that like helps me do my thing? And then what's like, if things are going really well, what's like the uh, top, top level? Uh, and that helps like psychologically to like, okay, you know, I didn't get enough money, but I'm still in the game and like I'm going to succeed. Uh, it also helps a little bit to... Uh, you know, when you're raising money to actually not go for the biggest number you could ever raise, right? Like mm-hmm. it's tempting to go, I'm raising a seed round, I'm raising 2 million, I have zero right now, right? Because then it looks like a, 
both mentally for you and also to the investors you're pitching, it seems like, oh, that's like a big objective. I don't know if they'll achieve it kind of thing. Yeah. But if you go for your lower objective, it's like, hey, you know, my initial target is 500K. I think I can, you know, have this much runway and achieve these objectives with that. That seems like, oh, it's like much more achievable. And then once you get 100K out of 500K, that feels like a lot more momentum than 100K yeah. of 2 million. Uh, so I think that really helps as well. One last question. When do you think any rules of thumb on when a founder should stop fundraising X number of no's, you know, if she hears 20 no's, is it time to go back to the drawing board or any just, when do you know to stop? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think some people have a tendency to stop too early and some people have a tendency to go too long. <laughs> uh, True. It partly yep. depends on like what round it is. Let's just say it's a seed round. Uh, you know, I would say like three months into it, like if it's, you know, if it's very stalled or like maybe it never got above zero, then like it's potentially like, you know, worth going back to the drawing board, getting more like, you know, getting more of these risks ticked off or getting some traction. Yep. Um, yeah, there isn't like a hard and fast rule on this. Uh, I think, you know, when you're getting momentum, like, you know, if you've run out of introductions, uh, if you've, yeah, you know, no one's saying yes for a long time. Like you can feel it. Uh, I do think like you should spend a significant amount of time on it though. It's not like, oh, I did it for a few weeks. I'm getting yeah. nose. Like I'm just going to stop doing this kind of thing. Like, you know, getting nose is the norm. So like you just have to be used to that and go, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. And like, you know, it only takes a few people to crack and then suddenly it becomes easier. Um, yeah, no, and, that's and, good. But you should be like iterating your pitch, trying to like understand what other objections people have, like how do I change them? What other type of investors this resonates with a little bit more? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. You know, fundraising is often harder than like just doing a company startup. So, uh, so I would yeah, you just have to be prepared for that work. Totally, totally, awesome. Well, Emma, this is awesome. Great advice. I've got a ton of notes here. This is going to be a good one. I can already tell. Um, if people want to learn more about your startup, it's mercury.co, right? Yep. And it's open for enrollment signups from anyone? Yeah, you just have to be a US company, but you can live anywhere, do anything. Well, Very within cool. limits, <laughs> legal limits. <laughs> legal limits, yes. Good. Well, awesome. Well, guys, anyone listening, go check out mercury.co. Uh, bank, banking for startups sounds real relevant and good for this audience. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck with Mercury and we'll catch you maybe after your Series B. Yeah, sounds good. And anyone fundraising out there, good luck. I know it can be hard, but you can do it. Treat it like a game. I actually like that advice. I say that a lot to people too because I think it's it's so psychologically brutal. It can be if you don't treat it like a game. It's you take it all personally, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the best salespeople are like very competitive and see a lot of things as a game and like, you know, fundraising is a sales process. Yeah, good. All right, on that note, over and out. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye. Thanks, bye.